Today we celebrate the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is a word gotten from the Latin, which means to come. There are three ways we talk about the coming of Jesus in history. First, we talk about Jesus came in history by the fact of the incarnation. The first way we look at it is Jesus was born as a child in the manger. That is the first coming. The second coming is every human being praying every day to have an encounter with Jesus. Jesus comes daily into our hearts through the Eucharist, through the prayer, through my devotion, through my encounter with him. That is another way of talking about the coming of Jesus. And according to the scripture, Jesus will come again at the end of time to judge the living and the dead. That's another way of talking about the coming of Jesus. Coming of Jesus as a child. Coming of Jesus into my heart. Coming of Jesus at the end of time. In looking at this coming of Jesus, there are two ways we can prepare for it. Let me explain it like this. You, you heard that an important visitor is coming to your house. The first level of preparation is sweeping of the house, repainting of the house, drawing up the, 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 the menu, the list. You give somebody money to go to the market to buy some things. You restock the house. That is a level of preparation. The second level of preparation will take place when you hear that the person has actually arrived at the airport and is on the way to the house. The minute you hear the person has arrived at the airport and is on his way, the second level of preparation takes place. You begin to change your clothes. The food begins. You begin to taste whether the food is ready. You get the dramas. You light up the place. And that is how it is in the church too. At the first instance, we begin to prepare. We prepare our minds for the coming of Jesus. From the 17th of December, that preparation will take a lighter and a rejoicing mode. The songs will begin to have rejoice added to it. We begin to spice up, begin to be bright. For us to prepare ourselves for this coming of, this, of Jesus, the scriptures say we must be vigilant and we must watch. To watch, therefore, only one who is awake can watch. Only one who is awake can be truly vigilant. What does it mean to be awake? For us to understand to be awake is to simply take a look at the difference between one who is asleep and one who is awake. It's only when one sleeps that he has the potentiality of dreaming. And every human being who dreams is locked up in a world of his own. He creates a self, a world of the self that he alone exists and does not connect with anyone. Only in the dream that a person can conjure anything in this life. He can conjure it just by himself. He creates the world by himself. Others cannot connect to that world. Imagine a person is hungry and he goes to bed. It's only in dream that the person can find himself while in Nigeria with the American president and he's in a banquet and he's popping up champagne, he's using champagne to wash his face and he sees all the chicken and the fowl moving and he's just slaughtering them, cutting them and eating, he's dining and whining. He is in a world of his own. Only in dream. He wakes up to discover that he's just in his room. Only dream can make that possible. It's only in dream you can find yourself in Nigeria. You are just on your couch. You just take a nap. Then in the dream, you can conjure yourself spending dollars. People are coming to you, hailing you. You are spending dollars. But you wake up in reality. You don't even have cash in your pocket. It's only in dream. In the dream, the person can conjure anything. He's in a world of his own. And the funniest thing is like, Others cannot say, because you are spending dollars in your dream, I want to join your dream. You can't connect to anybody in the dream. He's locked up in the self. 
One who is awake, to be awake means to leave that private world of one's own and enter into a communal reality, the truth that alone can unite all people. It's only when we are awake, all of us can say, when we are alive like this, we say, let us take him 129 and everybody in this hall can take the hymn together. It's only when we are awake we can say, let us stand and let us go to the field and all of us we move together. In the dream, I cannot say to everybody in my dream, like, let us stand and everybody will stand and join me to go to the field. No, unless I create it myself in my own world. So the dreamer is locked in his world. But he who is awake can enter the same reality with everybody. If this is true, therefore, conflict and lack of res reconciliation in the world stems from the fact that we lock ourselves into our own interest and opinion, into our own private world. Selfishness, both individual and collective, makes us prisoners of our own interests and our desire to stand against the truth and separate us from one another. If one is selfish, if we don't agree, if we don't reach consensus, it's because I have locked myself in the world of my own opinion. Outside me, nothing exists. No. Like what I keep saying or what we are taught, when we go to conference, all this seminar, they draw a six on the floor. When I'm standing here, I'm seeing a six. When you are standing there, you are seeing a nine. The fact that you are seeing a nine is not a sign that I have to argue that you are wrong. No. It's only when I put myself in your shoes, then I look at what you are seeing from your perspective. Then we can now deliberate. So they will teach us there are no right or wrong answers, but different ways of looking at things. So it depends on the perspective from which the other person is looking at before we can now analyze and say, from this perspective, this is not correct. Outside that one, it becomes an oppressive instrument to the other person if one is not careful. And this is the bane of selfishness. Every day I go out to work. Every day I go out to look for means of survival. If I do not have at the back of my mind that that other person out there is also looking for happiness. I lock myself in my world such that I acquire that happiness and that height at the detriment of my brothers and my sisters. Because I have locked myself in my world of opinion. But the minute I enter the same reality like every other person, I begin to understand that life is live and let others live too. That which I seek is that exactly which the other person seeks. For us to achieve this, this advent, for us to be truly awake, for us to understand what the scripture is teaching or asking of us this day, the scripture posits, he said, watch and be vigilant at all times. Perhaps in the words that constitute this watch, we can begin to understand what we can prepare ourselves to allow the coming of Jesus to be meaningful to us. Watch. W-A-T-C-H. Watch what? Perhaps the first is watch your word. As the book of Proverbs puts it, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. He who guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from distress. Proverb chapter 21 verse 23. And this is true. If you remember in the scripture when David went to bring the Ark of the Covenant. As David was dancing, dancing in front of the Ark of the Covenant. A lady that was not involved in the celebration saw David dancing. And she happens to be the daughter of Paul or Saul. As he saw David dancing, he now said, You are a disgrace to humanity. How can you, a king, bring yourself so down and you are dancing like this in front of the statue? And David was perplexed. And it was like, How can you insult me for dancing in front of God? And it was recorded in the word that that woman became barren for the rest of her life because she spoke against the child of God that was praising God. At that times in life too, the words of our mouth have landed us in big problem. Do you know that if you were the one that produced this item, for instance, this nose mark, I see this nose mark and I say, what a useless nose mark. How can somebody in existence do this? This nose mark is ugly. 
and I begin to criticize and run down this nose mark. The minute you that produce it hear it, what will you do? It brings down your spirit and you are going to be angry. The minute you are angry, every human being who is angry looks at what he wants to do to help the other person to calm down. So you think of how to inflict pain on the other person too, so that he understands that you are, by criticizing that which I have done, you are inflicting pain to the one who has made it. So nobody likes the works of his hand to be condemned. Rather, what they would like is, ah, this nose mark is very fine. If you adjust it like this, adjust it like this, oh, the best will come out. You will be very happy to hear that somebody has contributed and improved the quality of what you have done. And if this is true, therefore, every human being is made in the image and likeness of God. We reflect the glory of the Lord. We are creatures of God. Every human being, therefore, who criticizes another person, any human being who gossips about another person, criticizes the works of God's hand. And you run down the glory of the Lord. If you are not careful, you may find yourself fighting God. And who can battle with the Lord? They said, nobody. So if you are not careful, the words of your mouth can actually bring, become a source of problem to you. Take a clue from the Jewish people. The Israelites will never leave their home or at table, sit down without first going around and placing their hands on their children and say, God bless you. May, may things work well for you. They pronounce that words of prayer. They will never go to bed without going to the rooms of their children and give them a kiss and say, may tomorrow be a better day. May God keep watch over you all through the night. If we check all through history, behind every development, or the greatest development in our world today, the Jewish people are always there. If you check one of the most successful people, they are there. Despite the fact that they have been fighting before I was born, they are still progressive in all they do. But then, check how many of us in Nigeria, how many of us in our home, your child will do something to you. The next thing that comes out of your mouth is, God, punish that your mouth. And true, true, God will punish that mouth. When the child is growing up, he cannot talk well. He say, yeah, yeah, they worry your head. And true, true, yeah, yeah, will be worrying the head of that person. As he's growing up, he cannot think well. How many of us grow with all our level of education, yet nothing good can come out? Perhaps the courses that our parents have laid upon us can be, can be that which can be acting upon us. So as parents, be careful the words you channel to your children. Don't use the words of your mouth to destroy that which God has placed in you in charge of. Pronounce blessing. Because they say, decree a word and it shall come to pass. You see your husband is coming, you just shout, hey, wahala. And it's wahala you will get throughout that day. Let your husband not be wahala. You just see your wife, you say, hey, problem. Uh -huh. The only thing she will give you is what? Problem. And that's why today, people try to change some things. Because they say it is the word you decree that comes to pass. So when somebody is sick, they no longer say, I am sick. They say, I am strong. That one you have told a lie. It's, it's different. It is not a mark, as Futoshin will say, it's not a mark of humility for somebody who is tall to say, I am short. Or you are very brilliant. You now say, I am dull. It's not a mark of humility. You have told lies. Humility is, you say, I am tall, but it is the grace of God. I am brilliant, but it is the grace of God. You acknowledge the facts, but allude it to the grace of God. That's humility. It's not just by your own making. So don't confuse light telling with humility. No. Two different things. Decree the word and it shall come to pass. When you watch your word, you are secured. Again, you must watch your actions. The kind of things you do characterize who you are. Action speaks louder than words. You cannot claim to love somebody but consistently be the source of the pain of that person in life. Mind the kind of things you do. Let the works of your hands show that the depth of your heart is revealed through the actions of your hands. 
You can't continue to beat your partner. Then you say, Father, God knows that in my mind, in my mind, I love this person. No. Nobody knows what goes on in your mind apart from witches and wizards, which we are not. It is through the works of your hands, what you have done that helps us to know what is going on eternally. Purify your actions. Watch your actions, my dear friend. Because these actions, like Jesus will say in the scripture, I am not the one judging you. It is the works of your hands that will determine where you will be. So it's the works of your hands that will become a judge unto you. Mind your actions. The minute you watch your words, you watch your actions, the next thing you are going to watch is your thoughts. The kind of ideas that enters your head will influence your actions and your words. Purify your mind. And that's why we want parents to say, do not allow your children to see negative things. Don't stuff their ideas with negative things when they're around you. Be courageous enough to stuff them with value and virtues. I once, I was listening to somebody one of these days when I traveled. And the person was saying that, ah, that he doesn't like all these people that will just come, put bomb, and blast everybody. That he doesn't support that. That the only thing he likes in life is like, if anybody is offending you, just kill that one person and continue your journey. Anything that is removing your happiness, just delete that thing. Continue your journey. And as the guy was saying it, I was just lost the kind of ideas he had. Some few years later, I heard he killed his wife. And I was asking, you that went to marry that kind of person, did you not hear what he was saying? That anything that becomes a hindrance to your happiness, remove it. The day the wife offended him and he was angry, he did what? He deleted her. From your bad ideas will flow bad actions. You cannot have bad ideas and you expect good actions to come out of it. No. The church does not even support all these Machiavellian theories to say the end justifies the means. No. The church says both your intention, the object you pick, and the action you want to do and the result, all of them must be good. There is no how you need to apply negative to anything in order for positive to come out of it. No. Simple mathematics will teach us that the minute you apply negative to anything that is positive, you negate it. You cannot have negative ideas and you expect positive actions to come out of it. No. Both your ideas, your actions, and the outcome must all be positive. Purify it. So fill your mind with positive things. Don't read negative books. When you are reading it, you say, eh, Father, I'm just reading it. It's just for the fun of it. I don't do what I read. No. Knowledge can be acquired through what you see, what you hear, what you read. So the minute you acquire it, the knowledge is in you. It's just a matter of time. It will come out. You cannot be with filthy things. They say when the dog stays in the midst of excreta, after a while, the dog and the excreta will be the same. The minute you are in filthy things, it's just a matter of time. You too, you'll be like that. The minute you watch your words, you watch your actions, you watch your thoughts, watch your companions. The people you choose to walk with or surround yourself with can lead you to heaven or can lead you astray. Add people who can add value to your life around you. The minute you are with people who are toxic and negative oriented, you, it's just a matter of time. They will poison you too. I was telling one young boy, all his friends, they smoke cannabis, Igbo. And I was saying, Oga, you cannot be working with this kind of people. It does not characterize you. Our people say, show me your friend and I will say who you are. Because birds of a feather flock together. The minute you say you are friends, the mentality is not far from each other. That's why they say friends. Because friendship is to have same taste, same interest, same ideal. To have one mind in two bodies. That's friendship. So the minute you show me your friend, it tells me the kind of person you are. The boy he was arguing, he was saying, no, father, but I don't smoke. I said, no, it's not true. What is smoking? Smoking is to inhale, the, uh, how do you call it now? To inhale that fume. That is smoking. Now you are in the midst of 10 people. Each of them, they are smoking one one cigarette, one one ego, and they are puffing it out. 
puffing it out into your nose. While they are smoking one, you are inhaling ten. Then with time, they will now be saying, somebody will just come and say, ah, why are you bringing mommy's baby here? You say, ah, me, mommy's baby. Ah, you know, I, I can smoke or it's just that I choose not to smoke. They say, get out, you don't have liver. You want to prove to them that you have liver, you are courageous. What do you do? You take one. You try one. The minute you smoke one, another person will come another and say, ah, why are you not smoking now? You don't have liver. Ah, uh-uh, you will not be preaching. You say, no, but the other day I smoke now. You say, oh, I'm on a mistake. Before you know, you try another one. They will teach you one. You'll be trying one. You'll be trying one. Before you know, you will, in fact, they, they need to attach you, to align you as the, as the company spiritual director. Because the person that taught you is smoking one one. Your own now, you have started smoking packets. You are even smoking in such a way that the person that taught you will now be advising you, or God, reduce it. Have you not heard of things like that? Somebody will teach you something and the person will say, you are, you are overdoing it. Because all these years you have acquired unnecessary knowledge in the midst of bad companions. Mind your companions. Watch the kind of people you are aligned yourself with. You cannot be great in life by mingling with mediocres. You'll be great by mingling with great people. Great minds, they, they, they flock alike. You cannot spend all your life gossiping and you expect yourself to be high. No, you'll be on the level of those who gossip. If you want to be great, you have to be on the level of great people. Mind the kind of people you surround yourself with. So when you watch your words, you watch your action, you watch your thoughts, you watch your companion, all these things put put together will form the kind of habit you have. So watch your habits. You cannot have bad habits and you expect something good out of it. No. You must form good habits. There are people in our world today who have developed dirty habits. And they no longer have grip. And the minute you have the sin of the self, for instance, it becomes difficult because there are certain things you do which you have learned from your friends and they have encouraged you that you no longer have grip over. You may no longer be enjoying it, but you can no longer stop. Because it becomes addiction. And when people try to tell you, you see, you find yourself defending that which does not make sense. So St. Paul will say, at times, things we are supposed to be ashamed of are those things we pride ourselves in to defend it. It's only when we mingle with people we are not supposed to mingle, we will not begin to defend things we are not supposed to defend. Mind your thoughts, your, watch your words, watch your actions, watch your thoughts, watch your companion, and watch your habit. When you do all these things as we prepare ourselves for the coming of Jesus, Jesus will find a good place in our hearts to dwell. And this is all that Advent invites us to do, to watch. As all of us, we have gathered here to celebrate this Eucharist. Right now, we pray that Christ will come into us in form of bread and wine. But how many of us who come to church will actually receive Jesus? Ask yourself, what is it that prevents you? The whole idea of coming to church is so that you can receive Jesus. Will you leave this church without actually receiving Jesus? What is it that is preventing you from receiving that Jesus? This is what the scripture is inviting us to remove as we anticipate the birth of the Lord. If not, Christmas will not make any difference in our life. It will, not, it will not be different from any other day we have experienced in life. If tomorrow will be a better day, it's the preparation we make today that will make tomorrow a better one. This is all that the scripture is inviting us to do. Watch and pray at all times. Prayer adds nothing to God but draws us closer to him. The minute you have tried your efforts, you now ask God to come closer to you and you draw yourself closer to him. What else again can a human person wish for other than to be at peace and in goodwill with God? As we have come this day, I pray that as we begin a new year, a new season in the liturgical calendar, may the grace of the Holy Spirit abide in each and every one of us. Grant us the grace to have a good preparation so that at the coming of Christ at this Christmas, may he find a good soil in our hearts so that in dwelling with us, May it attract his favor upon us. And at the end of time, may salvation be ours through Christ our Lord.